Um, thank you for joining us. Um, we have not been able to meet together for the past couple of weeks. And my, what a few weeks those have been. Um, but uh, we are ready to go. We're actually really, we're really at the end here. Um, we have got six verses left. So I think the plan is to do three this week and we'll do three in the coming week. Um, and then we'll have to figure out what to do after that. <laughs> so, but as for right now, we'll focus on the task at hand. Um, all right, so that brings us to, uh, you know what, before I continue, let me just grab our, uh, where is it? our link. Give me one second here. I should have had that ready, I'm sorry. Uh, Okay, there's the link in the chat. Uh, if you'd like to catch up on anything, review anything, um, I believe I was told that nearly everything is on the website now. So um, that's in case you wanted to check out anything, it should be all there. Um, okay, so we are in the middle, um, or ne again, nearing the end of chapter 12. Uh, it's funny, we just had uh, over the holiday of Sukkot, so... Uh, uh, that we read the book of Kohelet on the holiday of Sukkot. And I had the opportunity to read it um, for the community. And I, uh, I'm i going through the verses and I'm realizing I don't even remember what I said, what, you know, what we said way back in those early chapters. So uh, I know myself, I'm going to have to do a lot of review um, before I uh, can say that I've uh, fully accomplished what I set out to do. Uh, but anyway, uh, so that's where we are right now. We're all the way at the end. So the advantage of the end is you don't remember the beginning. You can just do it again. All right. Uh, um, let's jump into the share screen and we'll take a look at what we got together. Here we go. Okay. All right. Give me a second here to set up my screen. All right. And we are again, this is chapter 12, verse number nine. And this is officially, I consider this to now be the officially. The beginning of the concluding verses. So the last verse we saw in the last class, which again was nearly a month ago, if not more, uh, was that he repeated the refrain from the beginning. Where in the beginning he said that, you know, Hevel, of all Hevels, everything is Hevel. He repeats that over here, but he actually, he cuts it down a little bit. Uh, and so what we said was, he, he I kind of got the sense of, whereas he... Um, at the beginning, everything was confusing and everything was Hevel. We've kind of actually cut down. It was seven Hevels at the beginning. Now it's only five, you know, so kind of that sense of if you've read through the book, at least some things hopefully will be a little bit more clear to you. Uh, not answering all the questions. It's impossible to answer all the questions uh, or to make uh, to condense all the fog, all the all the steam into uh, into usable material. But at least some of it may have become clearer. And so that's really the. The end of the last thought, kind of beginning, it's the bridge between the two thoughts. Now we're getting to the actual conclusion, concluding verses, which again is six verses to the end of the book. Okay. And so the verse says like this. V'yoter shehaya kohelet chacham. And more than that which kohelet was wise. Od, for, beyond that, limar da'at et ha'am. He taught knowledge to the, to the nation. He made it heard, and he delved into it. He came Mishalim Harbe, and he established. He set up many uh, parables, many parables. Okay. By the way, this is one of the hints uh, that tells us that Kohelet is the same person as King Solomon, as we've been referring to him this whole time, uh, who is the author of Mishle of Proverbs. Sorry, this is one of those hints to that that he is the same the same person. Because it says here that he made many mishalim, he made many proverbs. Um, I mean, there's other proofs to that also. The only other king of David who was, a, the only other son of David who was a king would be King Solomon. So that anyway covers that that base anyway. But again, he hints to that fact over here. Let's go through the verse one more time. More than the fact that Kohelet was a wise person. Ode beyond that, limad da'at he taught knowledge to the nation, v'izain, and he made it heard, v'chikar, and he delved into it, or he caused others to delve into it, honestly. Tikain mishalim harbe, and he established, or he put together many proverbs, many uh, parables, okay? So uh, this verse is telling us a number of things. 
again, this is our this is the beginning of the conclusion. So there's a number of I, I would say that what would King Solomon be trying to do with this conclusion? I guess that's really the first question. Right? So he's got this book of wisdom, right? That's the point of the book. The entire book from beginning to end was wisdom. He we we discussed the fact that he's talked for a significant amount of time about happiness and how it's how you're able to achieve happiness. But now he's talked about wisdom for a long time. And now, so with that discussion, what's he going to end off with saying? I believe what he's trying to point out over here uh, in the in this verse and the coming verses is he wants to leave you off with a way to continue the study of wisdom. Okay, that's an important piece. Uh, it's not enough for a person to just read something and say, okay, now I know it, right? The process of learning and the process of delving in and finding new things and uncovering new layers is an ongoing process. It's not just you walk away, feel you feel accomplished and you're done, but there are steps beyond that. So I think that's one of the things that he wants to point out over here is that the in his own uh, role as a wise person, he didn't just stop at the fact that he was wise. So beyond that which Kohelet was wise, that's good, great. Kohelet was wise. So glad for Kohelet. Nice. Have a, have a good day, Kohelet. It's not enough. Uh, Kohelet is teaching us that there's steps that come beyond that. So beyond what Kohelet did as a wise person is the fact that he did uh, three or four things. Depends on kind of how you count this. All right. So he does a number of things with his wisdom. Uh, number one is limad da'at ta'am. He taught it to other people. Uh, that is clearly a very important part of the process of uh, of being a wise person. Uh, the, uh, the, the Talmud points out, that I believe it was Rabbi Yochanan, one of the great sages of the Talmud, who tells us that um, I learned much from my rabbis, and I learned even more from my from my uh, compatriots, from those people who are on who are on the same level with me. But more than anything, I learned the most from my students. Um, and that's a very, very kind of Jewish uh, mindset, right? A lot of, we're, we're very big into education, <laughs> uh, all, always are. Uh, so the, this idea that it's not just enough to be wise in and of yourself, we have to do something with that wisdom. Uh, similarly, the Talmud is very clear, as are many of the sages of the many generations, is that the, the, the idea is not simply to be a learned person, but to be a teaching person, to be somebody who goes ahead and and takes the next step and imparts the knowledge and the wisdom to the next generation. Uh, we we find that in the prayers every day, uh, right before the reading of the Shema, uh, we pray for Lil Mud Ulamid to teach to learn and to teach, to have knowledge in order to be able to teach. So it's this constant passing over of information from one generation to the next. Uh, and so one of the roles that a wise person will take, not just Kohelet, but one of the things that a, that a wise person will do is they'll take the next step and they will also become a teacher. Uh, I find this, we've had, we've had a lot of days recently where we read the Hallel uh, in the prayers and, and the Hallel, the, the verses from Hallel, which are from taken from uh, King Solomon's father, from King David, uh, from, from uh, Psalms, from uh, Tehillim, so he says over there, he talks about how uh, all the people of the earth should praise God, and the Jews should praise God, and the children of Aaron should praise God, and those who fear God should praise God. And I always kind of understood it, and I, there's backing for this uh, idea also, is that there's those, you know, there's, there's, it's one thing to be a holy person, but there's a whole other thing to be from the children of Aaron. Now, we're not all children of Aaron, obviously, we're not all Kohanim. Uh, but the children of Aaron were tasked with the with the job of teaching other people. So everyone, to some degree, should try to become a teacher. You know, many people do it with their children, or with you know. They, you know, I'm lucky; I get a chance to to do this every week and to 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 work together with other people to try and understand these uh, these verses. So I get a chance to both learn and teach at the same time. Uh, so anyway, this process, this this uh, reciprocal process of I teach. You listen, you teach, I listen. That's going to improve the wisdom on the on the grander scale. Um, in a similar vein, we have the the, the concept that uh, uh, publisher perish, right? Uh, in, in the academic world, 
people always have to be coming up with new ideas and not just coming up with them, but you want to make some, you want to come up with ideas that you pass, you, you check with other people and see if they agree with and eventually to publish for the general audience. So there is this kind of concept that in, in all forms of wisdom, we're trying to uh, impart something to other people in which we actually gain more in the end also. Uh, but then King Solomon does another thing. And that is, he is also Izane. Now, this is an interesting word. I translated it right when I read it, uh, which is, he made it heard. Okay, it's, uh, we find this in a number of cases. Pro probably the most famous case of this uh, set of this uh, verb structure is in the uh, the second to last parsha of the Torah, Ha'azinu, Ha'azinu Ha'ashamayim Ba'adabera, the heavens should listen, should hear, and I will speak. That's the song at the end of, of the Torah. Uh, so izain does it do, does connote hearing. Ozen is an ear. Okay, uh, so izain would mean that he it, it put something. He made he, he made ears listen. Um, the uh, it, it's an interesting idea because the, it's not necessarily listening attentively. In fact, it's it's very different than shomea. To be shomea is to listen attentively. Izain almost means passive listening. So it's kind of a funny thing that he, we're saying that he he made the he made the people uh, passively listen. Kind of a strange thing to say. Uh, but the way I kind of understand this is that King Solomon put or Kohelet, you know, uh, code name Kohelet, uh, made this put into place a sort of compulsory learning. Uh, that's how I understand Izain. Izain means again, it's it's hearing. It's it's like the horse being brought to the water. It doesn't necessarily drink. So Izain is somebody who is, is when you force somebody into hearing. Um, uh, we, interestingly enough, as we use it in the prayers of Rosh Hashanah, we talk about that Hashem is Ma'azin Teruwa. He he listens to the Teruwa, to the crying sound of the shofar. It's almost as though God is also compelled to listen to the crying sound of the shofar. He, in that case, he compelled himself. He made a system where he has to listen when we blow the shofar, um, so to speak. Uh, you know, whenever you talk about God having to do something, you have to say, so to speak. Uh, but from our point of view, from our point of view. Um, but again, the idea being that over here, it would appear to me that beyond becoming a teacher, uh, Kohelet put into, into, into play or into place a compulsory education system. Now, we actually know this about King Solomon. There's a number of things that King Solomon did to ensure that education went ahead was or went forward in the Jewish people. Uh, he was part of a long line of teachers who made sure, who compelled education on the Jewish people. Um, and we've had it like that ever since. Uh, there's always been some form of compulsory education, uh, at least unbroken, at least in, since the times of the Talmud. Or actually earlier, since the times of the Second Temple, uh, some yeshiva system, some schooling system that were, were people were, uh, it, to a certain degree, compelled to 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 uh, to uh, participate in. Uh, the sages over here bring a very interesting idea. Izain ozen, besides for an ear, uh, is actually also a handle to a cup, a cup handle. It's called an ozen, ozen kli. Uh, so it, I mean, the idea being that a cup. Something coming off the side of a cup is like an ear coming off the side of a head, right? It actually is the ear of the cup. But the sages point out that King Solomon went ahead and made Oznaim a Torah. He made a handle to the Torah. He made certain ways that uh, the the Torah was was improved through his work. Uh, and the sages have a tradition that he put into place the idea of the eruv, which allows us to carry in certain instances on Shabbat. And he also put into place the tilat yadayim, hand washing. Uh, and I think that kind of fits with what we're saying is uh, certain rules, you know, uh, your average Jew is going to have to run into hand washing at some point. Hand, you know, wash your hands for bread. You know, you sit down to eat some bread, you wash your hands before doing it. Ritual washing. Or if somebody is, is, is Shabbat observant and they want to walk somewhere, they're going to have to know something about whether or not they can carry. So having those Kind of rules in place creates a compulsory education. So you got to learn something about this, otherwise you're you're not you're going to run into problems. So it's kind of this interesting idea that he created situations 
for us to increase our learning, uh, to increase our study. And that hopefully will draw a person into the next thing and the next thing, and then you'll become a uh, educated person in general. So again, it, it's 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 this compulsory. You don't have to listen, but at least at the very at the very least, King Solomon made a, a situation where you have to hear. You may not listen, but you'll hear. You know, that's kind of how I'm I'm seeing it. So beyond actually becoming a teacher, he also became a a a, 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 a pedagogue, a, a somebody who is 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 uh, is mindful and is cognizant of the needs of the people uh for for their education okay uh and the third slash fourth thing over here is he care he also created a, a possibility to delve deep into things um so hakar means to investigate right um a philosophy for example is referred to as mechaker as as the study as depth study of depth um so care is the idea that King Solomon also created something that you can delve into deeply. Um, and, and the way he did that, I kind of read as the next line is, Tikein Mishalim Harbei, he created all these parables, right? If you looked at the book of Kohelet, you'd be wondering, you know, how do I string all these things together if you didn't have two years of a, of, of a class trying to work on that exact problem? Right, it's very hard to figure out what does verse one have to do with verse two, have to do with chapter three, have to do with you know the the other this half of the book. Yeah, with uh, with all these speaking in in a parable like this makes it very difficult to understand. But it allows you to then think and 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 ponder and and delve into it. And again, working together obviously being the best thing. Uh, so and not only this, he wrote another book. He wrote the book of Mishle. He wrote the book of Proverbs. So you got a whole nother. 40 chapter book to to go into over there with a whole but different set of lessons uh you know besides for that he also the, probably the greatest parable of them all uh in fact it's noted as, as the greatest parable of them all would be uh the book of shia sirim of the song of songs which is a, a parable of passion between the jewish people and god um and it's referred to as the song of songs meaning the the most de the deepest of all the parables uh, I would say a song is a certain type of a of a parable of a proverb, and then that's the deepest of them all. Anyway, uh, again, that's not my idea. That's that's an idea that's that's echoed in a lot of the commentaries on Shira Shirim. Uh, it's interesting because all three of these things, three, four of these things, whatever you want to call it, however you want to number it, are a reference to the book we're reading. Right? He created a book that you could learn. He taught it to people. So he wrote down all these ideas to hear. He compelled you to listen to it. That means if, if you go to synagogue on, on Sukkot, you will hear the book of Kohelet, probably read very quickly. It's, a, it's, it's very much a compulsory listening. You don't have, you don't, it's very, at, at the speed with which we read in, in synagogue, in Shul, it's, it's very difficult to understand what's going on and def definitely to get any depth into it. But that also ignites the curiosity. And so in this one book, what he's saying is that the book of Kohelet has covered all three of these bases. It's a record of the teachings. It's a forced compulsory education experience. And it's uh, it, it's so deep and written in such a way that you have to put a little work into it if you want to understand what's going on. And that itself is the path towards furthering your knowledge of, of Chachmah, of wisdom, to go deeper into the role of the Chacham as you would do all three of these things. So the book itself, at the end of the book, he, he tells you that the book itself is a lesson in exploring wisdom further. <laughs> it's, it's, it's something that it, it covers all three bases and how a person would go about further exploring their, their wisdom. Okay, so that is verse number nine, <clears throat> which brings us to verse number 10. And this is a very interesting verse. I found it to, to mean one thing uh, to most of the commentaries. And then I found it personally to mean something else. Uh, so let, let's read it. It's a pretty simple verse, actually. Bikesh Kohelet limso divrei chefetz. Kohelet desired, desired, sorry. <clears throat> Kohelet desired, or had a will, I would say, to find words of chefetz, of desire. 
Okay, so he 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 wanted. He was seek, seek, seeking out to find words of desire. It's a better way. Bikesh means to seek something out. So Bikesh Kohelet lim so de Kohelet sought sought out to find words of desire. The chasuv share and written straight divrei ms the words of truth. Okay, written straight the words of truth. Let's read that one more time. Bikesh Kohelet. Kohelet sought out, sought, my tongue is getting twisted on all these words. Kohelet sought out Limso Divrechefetz to find words of desire, the Chatuv Yosher, and written straight Divre Emet are words of truth. Okay. So, what a lot of the commentaries explain over here is that, see, this is what Kohelet was trying to do the whole time. He was trying to give you these, these words that were. Beautiful, this this beautiful uh, piece of literature, this uh, the, these Torah thoughts, these godly thoughts, it's all there. It's all right in the book. Not necessarily a very uh, uh, exciting verse. It's kind of just a, a nice uh, epilogue over here. Hey, by the way, Kohelet is a really good book, right? It's it's filled with words of desire, straight talk, and uh, and and words of truth. Okay, um, but what I find is that the word bikesh you'll notice is, is usually if you seek out something, why would it just say say that umatsa kohelet divrei chifetz v'katuv yosher divrei emet? Why don't we just say that kohelet found words of desire? So the way I kind of see it writ written is the fact that he's seeking it out means that he sought out one thing, but he actually found something else. Uh, that's how I, I'm reading it. And by the way, that's how the sages read it too. I was surprised to see that there was a shift between what the sages explain in the Midrash and what the uh, commentaries uh, mark, remark over here, which is that the, the verse is divided into two parts. It's the first part is what he wanted to do, and the second part is what actually happened. So let's read it again like that, and you'll see that there's there's a little more depth to it. Bikesh Kohelet, Kohelet desired, he sought out to Limso Divrechefetz to create something that was desirous. I mean, really, when Kohelet sat down, you know, presuming that he's old man Kohelet, which is kind of everyone's assumption. Kohelet is the old man version of Solomon. So he sat down to write a book that would be desired by people, that people would want to read, that would be pleasant. You know, when you think about a fun, a, a good book to read, you're probably going to think of something that's easy to read or has warm, heartwarming lessons, perhaps. But what he found was the chatuv yosher. Once the words were straight and written straight, in other words, once he realized how straight he had to talk, he found divrei emet. He found words of truth. So I kind of see it as as a shift in goals that occur, occurred to Kohelet throughout this uh, process. His his initial intention was to write something that would be actually a little little bit more pleasant, right? No one's going to say that Kohelet is a uh, is a, is a pleasant. So, but that was really his intention. He wanted to give you something that would that would be enjoyable for you to read. But what he found was that he needed to talk straight. He needed to be much more clear and direct with what he was trying to say. And in that process, he found divrei emet. He found words of truth. Uh, and a number of lessons over there. <laughs> number one is that what people want to hear is not always what they need to hear. I think everyone knows that, right? Uh, what people desire to read what people divrei chifetz, things that would that would be desirous are not necessarily the thing, same thing as things that are emet, things that are truth. Uh, truth is is often uh, elusive and painful, and not necessarily what people want to be uh, to be hearing, right? So in that sense, I believe that part of what Kohelet is trying to say over here is, you know, you may have complaints on me <laughs> at the end of reading this whole book, you know, because. As we've pointed out, the Book of Kohelet is difficult to read, and it can be perceived as a downer, as as a as a very depressing book. Obviously, we we've just spent two years trying to figure out how it's not, how it's empowering, but in 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 one sense, it can be definitely read as something that is uh, that is that is not uh, not that is depressing. Let's just put it straight, right? It can be perceived as as depressing. But he said, you know what? I really wanted to find some. I really wanted to make something that was more upbeat. But what I found was I had to speak truth, and truth needed to be said this way. It had to be said straight, 
And I think there's a focus here on that straightness, uh, the chatuv yosher. And one, once it was written straight, chatuv is in the past tense, something that is written passively. Chatuv uh, yosher, once it has been passively written straight, it turns into divrei amet, turns into words of truth. So again, um, Kohelet is, is, is preempting, I guess not really preempting, he's, he's addressing the, uh, the, the, the simple reading of Kohelet as a, as, a, as a depressing book and saying, listen, I had, to, I had to talk about some things that were very true. And in addressing truth, it may have fallen away from the original goal of Dibre Chifetz, of words of desire, but in reality, this is, the, this is what people need to hear more than anything else. Again, We've already discussed. We've spent plenty of time in figuring out why it's not necessarily depressing. It's up. It's not. I wouldn't say uplifting. It's it's uh, not just depressing, but it is empowering. It does it provide a person with insight and foresight and and uh, um, uh, uh, presence uh, and all sorts of things. It provided a person with how to find happiness and wisdom. And so those are things that have to be spoken about. They are divrei amet. While they may not be divrei chifes, they may not be words of desire. Uh, the sages, in discussing this verse, also have it as a binary: that the first half of the verse is what he wanted to happen, and the second half of the verse is uh, is, uh, is what actually happened. They give other examples of other things that King Solomon wanted to happen, and other things did happen. You know, they said he said he wanted to know all the secrets that Moses knew, but he God told him that no, you're the wisest of all people, but Moses knew some things you don't know. You know, so that that's one of the things that they say. Um, again, not that's not the same thing I'm saying. Not the same thing the other commentaries were saying either. Just simply, they they also read this as a he wanted one thing and got something else, came out with something else. Um, so that's why I, I feel comfortable with, with my understanding of this verse over here uh, in the fact that it's a it, it, it's it's a uh, his intention, and then what actually came out at the end. Again, addressing. The, the unspoken or perhaps spoken question that many of the readers would have at the end of the book. Okay. Um, and with that, we move on to verse number 11. This is a very interesting verse. Uh, has many, many different interpretations. Uh, tons of different interpretations uh, and very uh, rare words also. Uh, so let, let's take a look at this over here. Um, it, will, it will take us a second here to, uh, to, to get through the verse. So it's divrei chachamim, the words of the wise, kadar vonot, are like a darban, or plural darban, darbans. Uh, a darban is a, uh, it's a, it's like a, a, a spike that is in the, on a yoke of a cow or a horse or something like that. It's a spike that keeps the animal from veering to the side. There's a spike or something near, near its head of some sort. That if it ever tries to veer, it gets poked with that, and it continues to go straight. Okay, it's it, it, I, I don't I, I don't live in the in the agrar agrarian society. I don't plow with cows very often myself, um, but my understanding is that's what a darban is. So the words of the chachamim, the words of the wise, are like the darban. Okay, they're like this uh, spike that guides the cow or the or the horse or whatever it is. Uchmas narot. Nituim ba'alei asufot, and they are like set uh, pins or nails. Nails, really. They are like set nails. The words of those who collect things. Nitenu be'roe echad. They have they have been given, or they have been given. Sorry, they have been given over by one shepherd. All right, clear as day. Easy verse, right? No one needs any explanation on that one, right? Okay, so let's go through that. Let's just translate all the words one more time. The words of the wise people are like this spike that again guides the 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 uh, the cow. I'm going to go with cow, all right? And the words of those who collect things are like set nails, right? Again, the, the, the commentaries almost all explain that the nail is the same, is similar to the darban. It's a similar uh, uh, mechanism going on. It's another another spike that's set into the yoke to keep the animal on track. 
However, they have all been given over by one shepherd, by a single shepherd. Okay. Uh, so again, this verse has a lot of a lot of understandings about what's going on. Uh, typically, it's understood that the one shepherd is either a reference to God himself, I uh, mean that the Torah, even the things that are told over by the sages or collected by the rabbis over many centuries have all were all given over by God. Okay, that's a that definitely that's one of the most uh, one of the most common explanations of what's going on over here is that it all comes even the even the rabbinic uh, edicts and things like that they all come from God given over to Moses on Sinai. Uh, or alternatively, the shepherd is referring to Moses himself, but he he gave over all this stuff, everything that we have, even the things which came later in history, uh, like Hanukkah, for example, uh, were alluded to at least by Moses, being this being the the great prophet that he was. He was able to at least allude to those things that were going to happen in the future in history. Okay, and that these words of the rabbis or the sages or whatever group are also have this, they have this feature that they guide a person, okay? They guide a person in the right direction as opposed to veering off and, and, and going where they're not supposed to go, okay? That's probably the most typical understanding of this verse. Uh, and it would just be, in that sense, it would be a praise of not just the Torah itself, but the, the uh, those who who keep and share the Torah with other people, which would be a fitting thing to have over here because we're talking about uh, the fact that Kohelet was a teacher. So that would be a fitting lesson over here. Um, I do think that there's a, a number of things that to point out, however. Uh, number one is that we got two groups, right? That's that very clear. We, we keep on showing up with this. We've got Chachamim, we've got wise people themselves. And then we have Baalei Asufot. Those are people who collect things. Um, so what I see over here is that there's two different types of leaders, all right? There's people who are leaders uh, or educators, let's say. There are educators who are in and of themselves wise people. And then there are other people who are simply, they collect what other people have, have created, right? So other people have said things and they collect them. Asaf means to collect things, okay? Uh, so uh, for example, Sukkot that, was just, that just ended is referred to in the Torah as the Chag Asif, the, uh, the, the holiday of the collection, because that's when people would gather, or the gathering holiday, when they would gather all their crops into their house at the end of the summer, uh, the beginning of the fall. Okay, so asufot, balei asufot, are people who collect things. So that's really two different types of teachers, rabbis, leaders. You know, some people are free thinkers. They are able to come up with new things themselves. And then there's other people who don't necessarily have that ability but they can tell you everything that was told to them. They are containers. They contain all the information of previous times. They're both necessary, but they do different jobs, I think. Um, and you notice that there's a difference between the darban and the masmar. Okay, that, by the way, you should just know masmar is a word is a word in modern Hebrew, except in modern Hebrew, it's usually spelled with a samach over here instead of a sin. The letters sin and samach are interchangeable throughout all of Tanakh for some reason. They have a similar sound or identical sound, so they get switched out a lot of places. Um, so, but you'll notice that the nails are are set; they're set into place. They can't move. Presumably, uh, by elimination, I would assume, or by contrast, I would assume that a darban would have some mobility to it. Uh, in other words, do you, typically, you want if you want your cow to go plow in a straight line, you'd use a masmar netua. You'd use a, a set uh, a nail, or, or yeah, the set nail thing that will keep it from never veering one way or the other. The darban, I, I would understand it would be something that would actually have some mobility to it that could guide it if, let's say, you need to turn a corner or, or, or change direction at some point, you could use the darban to change that direction. I don't know if that's true. Um, but it does seem to have, based on it's referred to a number of times in uh, in the uh, in the Mishnayot, uh, and it does seem to be detachable. So as opposed to the Masmar, which is clearly set in the place, that's by its it's referred to specifically 
as being set in place, the Darban has, it is detachable and can be moved around. So what I understand over here is that you have two different types of wise people that you could attach yourself to. There are people who are inherently wise. They have a wisdom. That means that when something new gets thrown at them, they don't just repeat what other people have told them because the, 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 the conditions have changed. So if the conditions have changed, the ideas, the, the guidance has to change. So the words of the wise, the actual wise people are like the darban. They keep you in, in the right direction, but they can be moved here and there. The wise person will know how to move that piece to set us in the right direction, right? If we start veering because of a change in conditions in, in a new direction, the Chachamim can change the direction for us using the Darban, as opposed to uh, the Ba'alei Asufot, somebody who can only repeat, you know, regurgitate information that they have collected from other people, they are much more like a set nail, right? They can only tell you one direction. I know in the past we've done this, right? It doesn't necessarily have any guidance for the future. You can't say, oh, well, conditions have changed. What, do you have any new ideas? All they can tell you is, I know we've done what we've done in the past. So these are both different types of leaders and educators, but they're different. Uh, you know, I would definitely assume that the the chacham would be a better leader, somebody who knows how to uh, how to uh, uh, mold based on the new conditions. Um, but I think in most times, you're more likely to find that leaders are baalei asufot. They are people who know what's worked in the past. You know. Um, yeah, how much of, uh, of, of, I'm just thinking of one social science, how much of, of uh, ec economics are, you know, we're still relying on on concepts written by uh, 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 Adam Smith, Hayek, uh, you know, all these, all, all, the old the old timey, uh, you know, Marx, you know, all, their ideas are still kind of guiding a lot of the theory nowadays, because many of the educated class are no more than Bali Asufot. They are just collections. There are people who are able to collect old ideas and, re and continue to reapply them. But when things actually change, you need somebody who's a chacham. You need somebody who's actually able to uh, analyze new information and use it like a darban and actually lead us in a new direction. Uh, kind of thinking of Adam Smith, Marx themselves, right? These, uh, these people who uh, created new ideas. Uh, again, that's just one, one social science. <laughs> um, or I guess, I don't know, is it economics or social science? Or is it a, maybe it's, I don't know if it's called social science. I think it, I think of it as a social science. Um, okay. Uh, so nevertheless, even though there are these two things and there is kind of a better and a worse, the worst is fantastic. Let's make that clear. It's need to know they have both been put into place by one shepherd, uh, the Mitsuda who's one of our go-to commentaries over here, we mentioned him a lot, uh, he points out that it's just continuing the parable, right? You've got the, 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 the cow that's being led. So the shepherd, shepherd is kind of a funny use. You'd think of a farmer more than a shepherd, but the shepherd is the one who's still guiding the animal in this situation. Um, and so even if the leaders around you are just balea folk, and you feel perhaps that they're not, they don't have everything that they need, uh, understand that there's still one shepherd who's running the entire situation, the entire uh, uh, party. <laughs> you know, so even if your leaders are Bali Asufot, don't downplay them for that. They are all prepared by the same shepherd. So this verse over here is, is again, continuing with this theme of how would a person go about and continue their process of studying wisdom? Well, Again, you're going to want to surround yourself with people who of both types. You're going to want to surround yourself with people who can, uh, who who can manipulate knowledge, who know how to use knowledge and and shift it. You also want to surround yourself with people who are containers of knowledge, who are about who who collect all the knowledge. Those are often different groups of people. You know, uh, you'll often find that very wise people, very smart people. Let's put it like that don't necessarily know everything. They just know a lot about one thing. So I would say that these are kind of two different skill sets. Baliasufo, that's an amazing thing. If somebody is able to just collect and collect and gather information, that's an amazing thing. 
and they can guide you in many situations. And on the other hand, you've got wise people who know how to manipulate the knowledge and learn and 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 take that and apply it to new situations. Um, I think there's another idea also over here, just kind of a, a hinted idea, is that you can have multiple things that come from the same source, or sorry, you can have one something that comes from the same source, but is understood by different people different ways. I was actually just having a conversation about this with a number of people uh, on the holiday uh, a week and a half ago, and um, we were talking about uh, the fact that authors often intend their story to be one thing. And the readers will take it a whole different direction. You know, we were actually talking about Lord of the Rings. I'm I love Lord of the Rings, um, but you know, some people will see it as a as a parable to World War One or World War Two, or, or some people see it as as the a hero's journey or some other story. Or you know, we were all talking about different ways that we perceive that story, how it means different things to, to different people. Um, similarly, uh, you know, I, I'm always I always think it's very funny. Uh, one of my favorite books is Moby Dick, uh, and everyone loves to talk about Moby Dick as the uh, you know the 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 folly of of being so myopic and looking for one thing and never you know never giving up and never forgiving and that's Captain Ahab's big uh, mistake and and it, it they they asked Herman Melville about it and he said hey, it's just a story about a about a, about a whale you know I, uh, it's it was not meant to be a big uh, 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 allegory for anything. But it ended up being that way. So I think it's interesting that you can have also one shepherd can give you one thing, but you'll have Chachamim reading it one way, Baalei Asufot reading it a different way. Everyone's going to have kind of a different take on it. So, that, I mean, the book we just read has a million ways to, uh, to, uh, to be read. We read it one way. You know, maybe we should start all over again and read it a different way. Are you all ready for that? You know? <laughs> Um, so I think that's kind of what he, he's saying is you're going to read it one way right now, and maybe you'll read it a different way in a, another time. You know, next to coat when you have it read it read in synagogue, then it'll come to, to you differently. So I think that's another idea of what needs new mirror echad is trying to tell us that you can have one thing that comes from one source, but you'll have different people read it different ways, and that process is continuation of the process of achieving wisdom. Okay. So again, that was verses 9, 10, and 11 of chapter 12, which leaves only three verses to go, which, God willing, we will get to next week. Thank you for joining us. Bye.